despite hurtful Trump attacks. Attorney General Jeff Sessions said he stood by his recusal from the federal probe into Russian election meddling and potential ties to the Trump campaign, despite President Donald Trump's repeated public rebukes of the move. I am confident I made the right decisions, a decision that is consistent for the rule of law, Sessions told Fox during an interview airing Thursday night. An attorney general who doesn't follow the law is not very effective in leading the Department of Justice. The attorney general added that he understood Trump's feelings on the matter. This has been a big distraction for him, he said. President Trump has scolded Sessions numerous times over the past week, both in public appearances and on social media, openly criticizing him for stepping away from the investigation. Trump has refused to say whether or not the intends to fire Sessions in light of his disappointment in him. But Sessions reaffirmed Thursday that he intends to carry on in his role until told otherwise. Sessions added, however, that if the president called for him to step aside that he would certainly do so. If he wants to make a change, he can certainly do so, Sessions said of Trump. I would be glad to yield in that circumstance. Sessions also told Fox that he felt Trump's public rebukes of him were kind of hurtful though he added that he still felt that the President of the United States is a strong leader. Sessions added, he is determined to move this country in the direction he believes it needs to go to make us great again. And he's had a lot of criticisms, and he's steadfastly determined to get his job done, and he wants all of us to do our jobs and that's what I intend to do. Trump has slammed the sitting Attorney General in recent days telling the New York Times last week that he would have never picked him had he known he planned to recuse himself from the ongoing federal probe on Russian election meddling and potential ties to the Trump campaign. Sanders scare must I let passion get the best of him on Priebus, Bannon remarks. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders said new communications director Anthony Scaramucci let his passion for serving President Donald Trump get the best of him when he made explosive remarks about fellow Trump administration staffers Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon. This is a guy who sometimes uses colorful and in many circles probably not appropriate language, the newly named press secretary said on Fox News Thursday addressing Scaramucci's explicit interview with The New Yorker in which he called Priebus a f, paranoid schizophrenic, and said of Bannon, I'm not Steve Bannon, I'm not trying to suck my own C. He's very passionate about the president and the president's agenda and I think he may have let that get the best of him in that conversation, Sanders added. Despite the feuding between Scaramucci, Bannon and Priebus spilling into public view, Sanders maintained that the White House is focused on fulfilling its obligations to the American people and not getting caught up in personnel squabbles. The bottom line is most of us here at the White House are focused on who has a job out in America, not who has a job here, she said. Scaramucci in recent days has come out swinging from within the West Wing, publicly threatening to fire everybody to stop damaging reports from leaking to the press and daring Priebus to come forth and prove that he is not one of the senior administration officials allegedly leaking information. Prior to Sanders' appearance on Fox, Scaramucci tweeted that he would seek to stop using his colorful language in the public sphere. I sometimes use colorful language, he tweeted. I will refrain in this arena but not give up the passionate fight for at real Donald Trump's agenda. Hash Want to see bipartisanship in Washington fire Mueller? Democrats and Republicans alike are growing increasingly strident with their warnings to the White House that Washington would reach a political breaking point, with no turning back for President Donald Trump, if he tries to fire special counsel Robert Mueller. Any effort to go after Mueller could be the beginning of the end of the Trump presidency unless Mueller did something wrong, Senator Lindsey Graham, RS.C, who in the late 1990s served as a House impeachment manager against President Bill Clinton, told reporters on Thursday. Honestly, it'd be a full-blown constitutional crisis, cautioned Senator Ed Markey, D. Mass. Trump has long complained about the multiple probes into Russian meddling in the 2016 election, which have heightened tensions in Washington and at times distracted the White House from its policy goals. 
While Trump has not said he plans to fire the special counsel, his top aides have acknowledged the subject has come up. The many rumblings about Mueller's future, which intensified over the past week after Trump publicly criticized Attorney General Jeff Sessions for recusing himself from the whole Russia affair, could unite lawmakers from both parties in a way few issues have. Graham on Thursday outlined bipartisan legislation that would block Trump from firing the special counsel, by requiring a judicial review first. And while that sounds like a long shot in a Congress controlled by Republicans, and with the president's veto pen waiting, lawmakers aren't backing down from their own investigations into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. In an interview Thursday, Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Richard Burr, RN.C said his investigation with Democratic Senator Mark Warner would continue no matter what Trump did to Mueller. I think there are a number of options for Congress if Mueller did get fired, Burr said, though he would not offer any details. I'd say the easiest way is to make sure there is no change in the special counsel, he added. I'm just hopeful they won't choose that route to go down. Firing Mueller wouldn't end the FBI investigation, either. The agents assigned to the Russia election meddling case would keep plugging away at their leads, law enforcement sources say. Getting rid of Mueller doesn't eliminate the wheels in motion, said Asha Vengappa, an associate dean at Yale Law School and a former special agent in the FBI's counterintelligence division. Trump, his lawyers and his surrogates have for weeks tried to publicly discredit Mueller's effort in particular several attorneys he's brought onto the task force who have made campaign contributions to Democrats. The Republican president's lawyers has also questioned the scope of the Mueller probe as it reportedly looks into Trump's business dealings dating back well before he ran for the presidency. And by bashing Sessions' decision to recuse himself from the investigation, as well as other moves by Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, Trump has sent repeated signals he could be laying the groundwork to kill the Mueller probe. To do that, Trump could order his Justice Department leadership to get rid of the special counsel, and then fire and replace them until they follow his instructions, much as President Richard Nixon did in the Saturday Night Massacre. In an interview with The New York Times last week, Trump sidestepped a direct question about whether he would consider firing Mueller. I can't answer that question because I don't think it's going to happen he said. But the new White House communications director, Anthony Scaramucci, told conservative radio host Hugh Hewitt in a Tuesday morning interview that the subject has come up during his talks with Trump. I'll be were on the record with this, in candid conversations with the president, I've said, why would you fire him? Scaramucci said. Democrats and even some Republicans aren't buying those assurances. If I were on White House staff, I'd be concerned about public perception of interrupting that process," said Rep. Mike Johnson, a freshman Republican from Louisiana who serves on the House Judiciary Committee. I just think they need to proceed very carefully. Sen. Richard Blumenthal, D. Connecticut, said he's been in talks with Graham and other senators about their legislative effort, which would require the courts to review any White House attempt to fire a special counsel investigating a president. There are definitely conversations about what can and should be done if Robert Mueller is fired because the president has raised it implicitly in some of his statements, Blumenthal said. Trump's public humiliation of Sessions this week has fueled speculation the president might fire his attorney general. Legal experts say Sessions was right to recuse himself since he played a public role in Trump's 2016 campaign. But Trump said he wouldn't have picked the Alabama Republican if he'd known Sessions would step back from the investigation. For now, Sessions is still on the job, but lawmakers said under no circumstances should Trump try to dump him while Congress is out of town in August. A recess appointee, who could serve for a period without being confirmed by the Senate, would be unacceptable, they said. Let me say, if such a situation arises. Democrats would use every tool in our toolbox to stymie such a recess appointment, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer warned in a Senate floor speech this week. If you're thinking of making a recess appointment to push at the Attorney General, forget about it. The presidency isn't a bull, and this country isn't a china shop, Senator Ben Sass, a Nebraska Republican and frequent Trump critic, said Thursday. 
Sessions defenders also included Graham, who warned Trump there would be holy hell to pay if he tried to fire the Attorney General, and Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley, who has vowed not to hold any confirmation hearings this year to replace Sessions if he loses his job. Still, several Republicans interviewed Thursday downplayed the notion that Mueller would be fired, despite Graham's dire public warnings. Good for Lindsey Graham, said Colorado GOP Rep. Ken Buck, another member of the House Judiciary Committee. It's just a distraction I'm not going to get distracted by. Tennessee Senator Bob Corker, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee who flirted with taking a Trump cabinet appointment, said he'd spoken with Graham about his legislation but refused to say whether he supported the concept until he'd read it more closely. There cannot be a real discussion taking place at the White House about firing Mueller. Since that cannot possibly be true, there's no reason to answer a question based on that conjecture, Corker said. Across the Capitol, Rep. Steve King, R. Iowa, a prominent Trump supporter, said lawmakers would make better use of their time by trying to rein in Mueller through legislation that requires him to hire nonpartisan attorneys who haven't made campaign contributions. He also wants a deadline established for Mueller's investigation, limits over which issues he can cover and a budget stating how much money can be spent on the investigation. Congress action shouldn't be so much trying to send a message to the president, about firing Mueller, should that happen, as it is to send a message to Mueller, he said. House Passes Spending Package with Border Wall Money the House passed a $789 billion defense spending package Thursday to fund the Pentagon, veterans' benefits and nuclear programs, while supporting what GOP leaders have dubbed a down payment for President Donald Trump's border wall. In a 235-192 vote, the chamber wrapped up work on the Make America Secure Appropriations Act, which bundles four of the 12 spending bills to fund the government beyond September 30. Five Democrats voted for the measure, including two from the border state of Arizona. About 80 percent of the bill's funding goes directly to the Pentagon, a total of more than $658 billion, which greatly exceeds Congress' current spending limits and would require lawmakers to strike a budget deal to achieve that higher allocation. We ask more of our military than ever before, and we need to support them here at home and abroad. House Appropriations Chairman Rodney Frelingson, RN.J, said on the floor. This four-bill package is carefully crafted to fund our critical military priorities. The rest of the funding would goes toward the Departments of Veterans Affairs and Energy, as well as the legislative branch, military construction and water infrastructure. Although the spending package does not include funding for the Department of Homeland Security, the inclusion of money for 70 miles of barriers along the U.S.-Mexico border became one of the bill's most contentious provisions. The measure's passage also caps several weeks of sparring on other contentious items, such as Congress' war authorization power and the military's rules on transgender troops. Before the bill reached the floor, House leaders scrapped language that would sunset the 2001 authorization of military force instead of replacing those provisions with a directive for the Trump administration to submit a report on the OMF. While Democrats were unsuccessful in their attempts to reverse the switch-up, even some GOP appropriators are saying a breakthrough could be possible now that there is a bipartisan bubbling of support for revisiting the 16-year-old war authorization. House leaders approached Rep. Tom Cole, R. Oklahoma, to help advance the watered-down OMF language, a sign. The appropriations cardinal says, that sentiment is slowly changing. That's the leadership reaching out and beginning to finally realize, wait a minute, there's something wrong here, when there's this much bipartisan support, Cole said. Still, Democrats hammered their GOP counterparts for ditching the war powers provisions, which had been debated and legitimately approved in committee. The bipartisan voices calling for action will not be silenced, Rep. Jim McGovern, Mass, said on the floor this week. But this is just one example of regular order being abandoned in order to advance an extreme agenda. While lawmakers submitted more than 330 amendments to the package, House leaders only allowed floor debate and votes on about half of those. 
the highly partisan package now heads to the Senate, where it is expected to be substantially reshaped, if not ignored altogether, as spending bills in the upper chamber require Democratic votes. Congress has until September 30 to complete all 12 spending bills. And House Republican leaders told lawmakers this week that they could create another package after August recess with the remaining eight spending measures, which are far more difficult to pass within the divided GOP conference. Republican appropriators are hopeful to pass more bills on the floor, though many acknowledge that a stopgap spending bill or an all-encompassing bundle is more likely in the three remaining work weeks before the end of September. The fate of the security minibus was uncertain just days earlier. Several conservatives were threatening to oppose the package if GOP leaders did not allow a vote on a controversial amendment to ban Pentagon-funded gender reassignment operations. House GOP leaders turned to Trump, who was eager to defuse that issue to see funding for his border wall materialize in the package. The president agreed to step in, and then took a step much further tweeting Wednesday morning that he would ban all transgender men and women from serving in the military. Scaramucci declares war on Priebus, Bannon Anthony Scaramucci, the flashy and sometimes profane Wall Street financier, was brought on as White House communications director last Friday. It's already clear he's a lot more than that. In the span of six days, he has launched a brutally edged campaign to identify White House leakers, threatened to fire everybody in the communications shop, and has declared war on Chief of Staff Reince Priebus and Chief Strategist Steve Bannon. Scaramucci, who boasted that he reports directly to President Donald Trump, has described his role as fixing the place, said one person who spoke with him this week. And he's wasting no time. In a vulgar interview with The New Yorker's Ryan Lee on Wednesday night, Scaramucci laced into Priebus for trying to see, block him from a job in the White House, called him a F, paranoid schizophrenic, and questioned Bannon's loyalty. I'm not Steve Bannon, I'm not trying to suck my own C, he said. One person who talked to Scaramucci said he talks openly about getting rid of Priebus the former Republican National Committee chairman whose job has appeared to be in jeopardy for months. He's got to go, this person said, summarizing Scaramucci's comments about Priebus. It's unclear how the New Yorker interview will impact Scaramucci's standing with Trump, but the president has already praised Scaramucci's brawler instincts, including his ability to get a retraction from CNN on an article that links Scaramucci to the Russia investigations. But his attacks on fellow aides are sure to draw some condemnations and questions about his own future in the West Wing. Scaramucci suggested in a tweet on Thursday evening that he would pull back on the profanities, but he did not apologize. I sometimes use colorful language. I will refrain in this arena but not give up the passionate fight for at real Donald Trump's agenda. Hash MAGA, he wrote. One White House official described the incident as a bump in the road for Scaramucci, and said that there was no expectation that he would be fired or punished for the interview. Nor any expectation that Trump will be inflamed by it. He didn't say anything negative about Trump, this person said. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders offered a defense of Scaramucci on Fox News on Thursday evening, saying he's someone who's very passionate about Trump. This is a guy who sometimes uses colorful and in many circles probably not appropriate language, Sanders said. He's very passionate about the president and the president's agenda and I think he may have let that get the best of him in that conversation. Scaramucci's arrival was described by one advisor as a cannonball from a diving board into a pool. With his brash Outerboro New York ethos and flair for showmanship, Scaramucci is perhaps more like Trump himself than anyone else on the White House staff, and his appointment is a clear signal that the president is walking away from his initial embrace of establishment Republicans familiar with Washington. Instead, Trump is choosing the gut-driven approach that won him the presidency. And that especially doesn't bode well for Priebus. The chief of staff has seen his power base steadily erode, losing first his deputy Katie Walsh who departed the administration in March and recently returned to the RNC, and then Press Secretary Sean Spicer, who resigned after it was clear that Scaramucci would be above him in the West Wing. 
some in the West Wing had thought it would be Priebus who would leave once the news of Scaramucci's hiring broke. In a potentially ominous sign, Priebus' usual defenders in the White House seemed subdued on Thursday, a noticeable shift from earlier in the administration, when public criticism of the chief of staff was met with a rapid response. No one seemed empowered to defend Priebus, unlike in the early days, when two paragraphs in a story about him could prompt six or more phone calls. One person who spoke to Priebus over the weekend said he'd wanted to make it to a year in the White House, but has settled for staying at least through health care. One reason Priebus and his allies opposed Scaramucci coming on board was they knew he wouldn't just be a comms person going on TV, one West Wing official said. Priebus has begun calling allies and asking for advice on whether he should stay in the job and how he should handle the situation, according to people familiar with the talks. One such call went to Speaker Paul Ryan earlier this week, who advised Priebus to stay and that the president needed him. They speak often, said Doug Andres, a Ryan spokesman, who declined to comment further. Priebus has continued to hold daily meetings in his office but people no longer feel like they have to attend, one senior White House official said. Newly elevated press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders declined to give Priebus a direct vote of confidence at the daily briefing Thursday, saying the president would let you know if he wasn't happy with his staff. The president enjoys healthy competition, Sanders said. Scaramus I got the president's blessing before going on television and criticizing Priebus on Thursday morning just before the daily 8 a.m. meeting where Priebus typically tries with little luck to set the agenda for the day. The communications director, who described Priebus last week as a sibling's child rival, responded to a question about his relationship with the chief of staff by mentioning the biblical brothers Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Scaramus I taunted Priebus over leaks again hours after posting and then deleting a tweet that seemed to suggest he believed Priebus had been involved in the release of his financial disclosure form, a public document that was released by a federal government agency. If he wants to prove he's not a leaker, let him do it, Scaramus I said on CNN. He said there are only two people who can be trusted in the White House. I can tell you two fish that don't stink, Scaramus I said to CNN. That's me and the president. There are people inside this administration that think it's their job to save America from this president, he added. Priebus told others he did not leak Scaramucci's financial disclosure form and that he doesn't understand why Scaramucci would make such an accusation without facts. He has tried to soldier on in the job, showing up early in the West Wing every morning. Everyone knows he's not in charge, said one senior West Wing official. Whether Scaramucci who seems to have an innate understanding of Trump, remains his flavor of the month, in the words of one advisor, seems unclear. But friends say Trump is already more comfortable with Scaramucci, who is forceful and smooth on TV, and that he respects Scaramucci for his business acumen. If this is less of a S show because Anthony Scaramucci is imposing some discipline and getting things done, that's good for the country. It's good for the country to have a functioning government even if you disagree vehemently, said Stu Lozer, a friend and former press secretary to Michael Bloomberg. Anthony is helping the president and will continue to help the president. Scaramucci doesn't have much government experience, and that could create problems, said Julian Zleiser, a presidential historian at Princeton University, even if Trump loves his machismo and public appearances. The administration is far behind on staffing and has struggled to get its legislative agenda through. It is totally out of control, chaos, Zleiser said. This is unnerving people in Washington and everywhere, where the president's advisors can't get him to do anything and are behaving like this. Trent Lott, a lobbyist and former Senate Majority Leader, said he didn't understand the reasoning behind some of the White House's actions, particularly the president's tweets. They really need to get some positive things to talk about, Lott said. And Newt Gingrich, the former House Speaker who serves as a surrogate for Trump, offered some advice to Priebus, as he copes with being on the ropes, just do your job. Ignore the noise, assume it's noise, he said in an interview. He's the chief of staff and he's the chief of staff until he is.
candidate for DHS job withdraws because of transgender ban. A candidate for a senior position at the Department of Homeland Security withdrew from consideration on Wednesday, citing President Donald Trump's decision to ban transgender people from serving in the military. John Flaherty, a former executive director of the Delaware Republican Party, informed a DHS official in an email Wednesday morning that he was pulling out of contention to be the Assistant Secretary of Partnership and Engagement at the department. As I mentioned in our conversation, I am a strong advocate for diversity, both in the Republican Party and in government, Flaherty wrote in an email obtained by Politico. The president's announcement this morning, that he will ban all of those who identify as transgender from military service, runs counter to my deeply held beliefs, and it would be impossible for me to commit to serving the administration knowing that I would be working against those values. Flaherty, who is openly gay, said he interviewed for the job on Tuesday, one day before Trump's surprise tweet that the government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. The decision blindsided much of the federal government, including many at the Defense Department and in the White House. It has led to widespread confusion about the what will happen to openly transgender members of the military, and the White House has not yet provided clarity on the issue. Department officials confirmed Flaherty was under consideration though it's unclear whether he was in line to get the job at the department. He was one of many candidates being considered and he withdrew from consideration, DHS spokesman David LePan wrote in an email. We're not aware of anyone else who withdrew for that reason. DHS has had trouble filling the Assistant Secretary of Partnership and Engagement position. David Clark, the sheriff of Milwaukee County, Wisconsin who had come under criticism for a series of deaths at the jails he oversees, was under consideration for the job. But DHS announced in June that he was no longer in contention. The assistant secretary, which does not require Senate confirmation, coordinates outreach to state, local and tribal officials and law enforcement. Flaherty said he was contacted about the prospect of applying for the position last week, and agreed to do the interview on Tuesday. Though he was interested in the post, he opted against it after the president's announcement.